from Kim Jong-un dumping his bags of crypto, supposedly, on the marketplace to an absolute buying spree on Ethereum. This weekend was a wild ride in cryptocurrency. Stay tuned as we break it all down. This is Breaking Bitcoin. Hi, my name is Jude Nelson. I'm an engineering partner at Blockstack, and you're watching Breaking Bitcoin. Welcome back to Breaking Bitcoin. We are live every day at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. This is your daily source for everything markets and finance. My name is Justin Wise, lead analyst at KrakenCryptocurrency.com. Hopefully, you guys are doing absolutely fantastic today. We've got a heck of a show. We're going to be covering today the rumors and the results across the blockchain, across with market speculators uh, of Kim Jong-un, apparently rumored to be in critical condition, depending on what you know, blacklist CIA web circular you subscribe to. Unclear, unclear actually, as is the Iron Curtain surrounding North Korea. Uh, but we'll be talk talking about that, covering that. We'll also be talking about Grayscale Investments' latest circular and kind of this buying spree that's been happening on Ethereum. Of course, we'll be covering the latest price action with Bitcoin. So to cover price action on Bitcoin, I just did just want to say this. You know, obviously the weekend was quite interesting. You know, a lot of the traders in here are going to be ignoring the weekends or not trading on the weekends. Uh, we got a lot of traders in here that are going to be just kind of observing the Monday through Friday split because they want to have, you know, time with their families or just they want to filter out weekends and price action. And these are some fairly popular charts because we see a lot of charts and we see a lot of traders implementing price action with uh, uh, with excluding weekend data on Bitcoin. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Now, I myself do tend to be a little hesitant of uh, signals because as we will often see on weekends, we have high volatility, but low volume. And Bitcoin has been kind of a... a uh, uh, Bitcoin's volume has been relatively low uh, across the last few weeks, even even with uh, kind of the upside price movements. Now, markets have gapped open today, but we can see Bitcoin slipping as we move into the afternoon. However, volatility is quite low, really hasn't risen to dramatic degrees, uh, implied volatility and actual realized volatility. So uh, it does kind of make it does, you know, price action like this can make you kind of feel like, you know, when is the next big move? And often this is where your reversal traders are going to come out and start talking. And we can see that a little bit with skew rising, meaning that put options are being put on, right? People are buying puts to cover themselves, whether they're trading directionally or whether they're hedging. Uh, and open interest is not actually rising. It is on the lower time frames now as we move into these movements to the downside, actually, as we kind of reach this halfway mark. However, we're not really in any significant danger zone. So we'll break that all down when we get into the daily price analysis. Overall, my sentiment on today, what I kind of expect to see today and moving forward uh, is a bit of a pullback, uh, an attempt to see price move to the downside to give us a little bit better entry. I'm not really... Um, Although I am prepared and I'm watching for a very important thing. And we'll see that here just a little bit when we get to the charts. I am watching for a technical indication that we're going to have a more pronounced pullback, which would be not off the table yet. Now, overall, I am bullish. I am in long positions. But, you know, we did just get a hash ribbons buy signal. However, I want to go into the nuance on that because it's not a foolproof thing, right? Almost every halvening, we do see a dramatic pullback. Now, we're just 16 days away from the halving, 16 or 15 days away from the halvening now. And, you know, individuals, uh, and we can see this uh, from the reports from like OSL, we do see increased sell flow from large funds of Bitcoin, right? So larger funds are selling Bitcoin in higher in higher quantities, but larger individual investors, high net worth individuals are actually purchasing more BTC. So one thing that we could derive from this, one thing, you know, kind of I think the overall situation where we are in the markets is that you have a lot of individuals uh, with strong convictions and beliefs, maybe particularly in Bitcoin or just looking and starting to believe this, you know, anti-fiat narrative that the fiat system is collapsing, that we're absolutely seeing the traditional economic system collapse, and they want to rush into a safe haven as quickly as possible. Now, although that does tend to be the narrative and the mindset that we want to, uh, that we want to, um, that we want to promote around here, we do want to promote the adoption of a sound monetary system. We do want to promote the adoption of Bitcoin, and we do view it as a sounder alternative to the current economic regime of a debt-based society, of a debt-based economy. It's not sustainable in the long run. We go over this many, many times. We know that Bitcoin is a sounder money. We know that Bitcoin is a harder money. It's a deflationary currency. It has all the intangible properties that make up a good monetary system. And, it, and because it is digitally based and digitally secure, it is a good system to transition to based on where we are now. 
right? I'm a strong advocate for a Bitcoin-based society and a Bitcoin-based economy. However, when it comes to the realm of trading, we have to ask ourselves, are we in a situation where retail, even if they are high net worth individuals, are kind of being spurred on right now by their belief that the halvening will be a bullish event and that the current system is failing. And keep in mind, if the current system were to fail, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. These things, you know, empires collapse over time. So is it possible that we are actually seeing individuals rush in and buy in larger quantities at somewhat of the worst time? And we are going to have a pronou uh, more pronounced pullback on our hands, something in the realm of maybe 15 to 25 percent, which would not be out of the question for what we've seen on run ups to previous happenings. And then after that last significant correction happens, not a healthy retracement, I'm talking a pretty big, steep sell down. Then we then after we've kind of shaken out the last of those buyers, price can then move up. Uh, and this is when we finally get that decoupling from traditional markets, because overall, Bitcoin is currently moving in lockstep with the index, with the S&P acting like a risk on asset. So all questions to keep in mind when you are considering your buy Overall, again, one of the safest approaches to buying Bitcoin that has been for a very long, long time is simply a dollar cost averaging approach. And statistically, with the hash ribbon signal, right, and with Bitcoin where it is, primed for a happening, accumulation over the next 30 to 60 days, dollar cost averaging is statistically a good bet for the long term, right? So that's something that I'm going to be doing. However, as with all things, I think that we still, while we still have, and we always really do have, right, there's never a time ever in history where any market analyst or any trader or anybody who watches the markets can say to you, there's no way we're going to have another 20 to 30 percent pullback. There's absolutely no way. Right. And we can, you know, kind of see that with with skew rising, right, with traders putting on more protection with hedges being putting on at these price levels. Right. Right. So keep that all in mind. Keep that all in mind as you guys are making your individual purchasing decisions, because at the end of the day, it's only going to be you and your monitor, maybe your hard drive that are going to be accountable. To, you have to be accountable to yourself for your own decisions. So that is why we at Cracking Cryptocurrency keep at the foremost of our strategy. And one of the hugest secrets to our success is risk management. Keep your risk management tight, position size appropriately for every single trade. Because when it comes to the realm of trading, there is a concept here that those from the realm of poker will understand, and that is bankroll management. As long as you maintain your bankroll and you can continue to play at the table, then you can be successful because you can win back losings and you can go on winning streaks, right? However, if there is ever a moment, ever a time where you go all in on a bet because you think that this is the thing, this is the trade, this is the bet, this is where you just throw it all in and double your money. Listen, as attractive as that sounds, right, the, the likelihood that that is going to happen to you, that you are going to have the, fan, you know, kind of the fantasy, you know, the, you know, traders come in and they get rich within a month or you see these, you know, advertisements that, uh, you know, this trader from Florida traded from home and made six million dollars in a year. The likelihood that that's going to happen to you is extremely unlikely. But the likelihood that you can approach the financial markets, that you can approach the realm of trading, particularly with the volatility of cryptocurrency and the liquidity of cryptocurrency, and be able to make a sustainable and profitable side hustle and or primary occupation is more real now than it has ever been in the past for a retail investor wanting to come in as long as he wants to learn and is willing to learn the same way in a consistent, consistent, verifiable systems approach to the market, right? It is absolutely possible. However, what we see, as with all things, we see individuals come in, they want to trade like cowboys, and they end up getting burned out, right? The failure rate is very high, so do not be on the failure rate. That's why you're watching this channel. That's why you're watching this show. With that being said, there's a lot I want to cover in the news. This Kim Jong-un thing is really interesting to me. So let's break that down before we get into the markets. And then I wanted to cover Grayscale before we get into the markets as well. So if you guys are new to the channel, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Otherwise, you're not going to be notified, and others aren't going to even know that we exist. And Make sure to let us know how you're doing in the comment section. The moderators will grab them and bring them to my attention as we move on into the show. With that being said, let's get going. Let's get going over here. Okay, good. We're back. We're back. All right. Uh, Don Cannon, thank you so much for the 20 crones. He says, nice watch. Uh, all you need is a gold grill. Uh, you know, maybe I could go get fitted for one. Maybe I go get fitted for one. Uh, <laughs> nothing could ever compare to your platinum grill there, Mr. Don Cannon. Hopefully you're doing well over there. All right. So, uh, now, so as many of you have already heard, speculation ran fairly rampant this weekend surrounding North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, having died or supposedly dying in a coma after a botched heart surgery. 
But this was a joke tweet. You know, that being said, it was a joke tweet concerning Kim's huge bag of Bitcoin making its way onto exchanges that really caused alarm amongst the cryptocurrency traders and market speculators. And this joke apparently went over the heads of crypto Twitter as it ran wild this weekend, thanks in part to an author of the tweet being a Coindesk staffer. Therefore, many assumed that his comments were pretty legitimate, right? So the tweet was by Zach Vole. He works for Coindesk, and it appeared to claim that Kim Jong-un had transferred about 65,000 Bitcoin from a Trezor wallet to Coinbase, right? As this word began to spread, traders were left in fear that amidst the madness of North Korea, uh, following the death of Kim Jong-un, someone was liquidating Kim's personal stash of Bitcoin and with 65,000 Bitcoin getting dumped onto markets, Bitcoin's price would have been sent crashing, right? Zach Vol is the Coindesk reporter on the market's beat. He wrote the tweet in a whale alert style, right? With the with all the little flashy emojis, right? Uh, and that's another Twitter account, obviously, for those of you who don't know. Whale Alerts is a Twitter account that posts regular updates on long transfers that were spotted on chain. Right, uh, sixty-five thousand would have been worth about five hundred million dollars. Still worth about five hundred million dollars at current market price. And the implication behind this transfer from his treasure, from his treasure wallet, was that he might have died, and that vultures in the regime were preparing to cash out with the former leader's crypto bags. The only thing was, um, this this was not true. It's totally not true. This was this is false. Um, of course, this is following in the wake of last week's breaking news that Kim was possibly dead. Uh, rumors have been circulating that the leader is sick with heart troubles. And this lent credence to the idea that North Korea could be, as a result, preparing to sell its massive reserve of ill-gotten Bitcoin, because, of course, North Korea is pretty prevalent in the, in the crypto scams and other cryptocurrencies. Now, some estimate that fund to total over $700 million, funds which were accumulated as part of North Korea's effort to bypass international sanctions on the so-called rogue nation, uh, their economy and their finances. Now, naturally, a fire sale of this much Bitcoin, if it were true, would send crypto markets crashing under the half billion dollars worth of sell pressure being suddenly and unexpectedly exerted onto market pressure. This slippage for the love of God. Now, Vol did go on to later delete the tweet, but not before it was shared extensively across social media over the weekend. This triggered alarm among traders, among desks, among the entire crypto space, particularly within the Asian cryptocurrency community. All right. Now, one tweet uh, by Molly from HashKeyHub gives us a glimpse at how much buzz the rumor generated inside the Asian world of crypto, writing that uh, she woke up, saw everyone talking about this literally everywhere, Weibo, WeChat groups, all crypto media uh, entirely, at Zach Vol. And now Coindesk Zach, did, he did end up deleting the tweet, but he remains pretty unrepentant for the stir that he's caused. And not all of those who were taken in by the ruse are actually amused at his kind of cavalier attitude. Others, however, you know, myself included, choose to look at the funny side of this and keep the comedy rolling. Uh, David Gerard, writing in the 50-foot blockchain newsletter, half-jokingly wrote that, you know, everyone knows that Kim Jong-un's really into Ethereum, not Bitcoin. All right. Uh, now, this was, of course, based on last year's incident, by the way. Uh, so a little fact behind this, when Ethereum developer uh, Virgil Griffith traveled to North Korea in order to give a development seminar on Ethereum. Now, interestingly enough, Griffith was later arrested by U.S. authorities over allegations that it was, in fact, an effort to teach the regime how to launder money and skirt United States sanctions using cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. So... No good deed goes unpunished in the world today. Now, another character in the crypto sphere, John McAfee, chimed in as well, saying, <laughs> this dude's photoshops are awesome, saying that he, uh, that he isn't buying into the rumors, saying, nonsense, Kim Jong-un's with me, it's straight chilling. Now, on Sunday, uh, Moon Chung-in, who is a national security advisor to the South Korean president, told CNN that Kim was alive and well, adding that intelligence data showed that North Korea's leader was staying in Wansa, a resort town on North Korea's east coast. So this is the latest information that we have. This could make it one of those rare occasions 
where McAfee may actually be correct and Kim Jong-un is still alive and kicking. So, But as of this afternoon, it's still unclear officially what the status is of the North Korean leader. Uh, major media outlets are reporting that South Korean officials feel the rumors of his death are actually incorrect, so that he's not actually officially dead. However, CNN claims, CNN, <laughs> claims that their source in U.S. intelligence has confirmed that Kim is in fact in grave danger following his botched heart surgery. At the moment, the death of the North Korean leader remains unconfirmed, and largely these are just rumors. But what we do know for sure is that Kimmy does not appear to be dumping his Bitcoin bags on Coinbase right now, nor would he ever in the future, right? So, uh, you know, a little aside here, right? A little aside. Um, if you ever, uh, ever, ever, ever hear a rumor about, about, some, uh, about some massive whale dumping their bags on a regular exchange, that's not going to happen, right? This is why OTC exists. There's not uh, anyone uh, that wants to exit their positions quickly is either A, going to utilize limit orders. They're going to have a professional manage this, and professionals are going to use a mixture of OTC. And if the demand isn't there, which it really should be, uh, depending on the size of the order, of course, everything is quantifiable. Uh, depending on the size of the, of the quantity of BTC that needs to be fulfilled, uh, a price is going to be negotiated underneath market value. Uh, and there's not going to be slippage because it is a peer-to-peer -peer transaction at that point in time with the OTC desk asking, acting as middleman uh, and taking their fee. And that is the most efficient way for large quantities of Bitcoin to be settled. Uh, this is what all original Bitcoin OGs utilize. This is what professional desks utilize. And there's all kinds of different desks. And there's professionals that will handle this for you. Uh, you know, when you, you know, the more money you have, the more service-based uh, industries tend to become. Uh, nobody's going to go to, nobody uh, is going to go to, uh, now, the, like, you know, but what's funny about this is that this has happened before, but not with these quantities, right? Nobody's going to go to Bitfinex and fat finger market sell 67,000 Bitcoin, right? Um, while that is not impossible, uh, that is, that's a true black swan event. Um, and that person would forever regret that because the slippage on that would be absolutely atrocious. So you're either going to see a combination of limit cells or you're going to see a combination of, um, or you're going to see OTC desk, in which case you won't see the actual volume because that type of market sell would suppress the price so dramatically that it would potentially wipe out the books. And we saw this with the BitMEX liquidation engine, right? We saw the BitMEX liquidation engine absolutely clobbering price to the downside. And that's largely a function of supply and demand, right? There was not enough demand on the bid side books to actually... Um, to actually account for all the liquidations that needed to be settled, right? Remember, when it, you know, it's just kind of like printing money, right? For every dollar that's paid off, one dollar exit circulation, all dollar is debt, right? Uh, and for you know, perpetual contracts, you know, there is no, uh, the exchange doesn't actually have stake in the positioning in a perfect world, uh, of the long to shorts ratio. For every long, there is a short. And so to close out a position, to take a position away, there needs to be a position on the other side of the book. There has to be a willing buyer uh, to cover a sell. All right, so whenever you sell, you're selling to somebody. Whenever you buy, you're buying from somebody. And if there's not somebody there to buy from you at the price that you want to sell at, then you're going to be filled at the lowest possible uh, buy, the lowest possible bid, if you are utilizing a market sell. And you can see this very clearly, right? If you go and look at the last traded price uh, and you market buy, you're not going to buy the last uh, traded price, the current price, right? Current price is always last traded price. It's this, what we agree the price is right now at this moment, right? If you market buy, you are going to buy the first available offer, right? Which is the, which is going to be higher. It's going to be the, the, the spread, the spread between last traded price and first available offer. And if you market sell, similarly, you're going to be buying the, uh, the highest available bid, right? Lowest available, bid, highest available bid. Um, and if there's, you know, let's say that, you know, price is currently 10,000, and for whatever reason, all all bids between ten thousand and nine thousand and one dollars have been cleared off the books. And you market sell, you're going to get filled at nine thousand and one dollars. That's just how it's going to work. This is how uh, this is how exchanges work. Now, with that being said, I want to get to the next story before we get into the market news. Uh, now, Grayscale Investments, uh, Grayscale Investments, which is you know considered to be the leading digital asset management firm on the scene, seems to have purchased as much as fifty percent of all Ethereum mined in 2020 to date, new reports suggest. Now, Grayscale recently outlined in their Q1 operating report how increased interest from institutional investors is behind this new demand. 
with hints that the upcoming launch of Ethereum 2.0 is most likely one of the biggest reasons behind this latest trend in increased demand for Ethereum. All right. Now, this latest information gathered from blockchain data shows about 1.56 million Ethereum being mined since the beginning of January 2020. So that's how much Ethereum roughly has been mined so far this year. At the same time, the Grayscale Investments Ethereum Trust, ETH, e ticker symbol, had issued 5.23 million shares as of December 31st last year. And per their website, the firm had 13.2 million shares as of April 24th, 2020. Do the math. With each share of the ETH e worth about 0 0.0, almost 0 0.0, almost 0 0.1, it's 0 0.09 and a half about Ethereum. That means the firm bought about 756 Ethereum. Uh, since since the last time they issued their statement on December 31st and now, right, uh, up to the latest one on April 24th. And with all that data in mind, it would appear, therefore, that they've purchased about half of all the Ethereum mined this year to date, right? Now, the firm's paper regarding the, Q4, uh, the Q1 performance pointed out that institutional investors have been accumulating substantial portions of the second largest digital asset by market capitalization, Ethereum, despite current market volatility and the proclamations that we, of course, have to have a lower low. Now, during Q1 2020, the Ethereum Trust saw about $110 million worth of USD inflows, which is more than all previous in inflows combined for the past two years, $95.8 million. The upcoming release of Ethereum 2.0, which will complete the migration from Ethereum's current proof of work consensus algorithm to the new proof of stake consensus algorithm, are most likely the main reasons behind this high buying interest, right? In the annual document on Ethereum's development, Grayscale explicitly introduced and explained this new concept, saying that one of the biggest benefits to this upgrade will be increasing the scalability of the database. Apparently, Ethereum institutional investors really get excited about scaling databases. Now, Ethereum investors buying through Grayscale are not slowing down, despite even a significant premium uh, of about uh, over 40%, over right? As of April 24th, right, one share of ETHE cost $92 to buy, while the holdings per share were worth just about $17.70. So that's almost a 400% uh, almost a 400% premium. In other words, institutions are happy paying a ridiculous premium. As long as they don't have to worry about actually storing, transferring, or manage the cryptocurrency on their own. They are, they are absolutely tickled pink to pay almost 4x, to get 4x less than they possibly could, just so they don't have to deal with management. So right there, that is a, that's a, that's, that's a hustle out there, by the way, guys. Third party. Uh, the spot price of the asset, on the other hand, uh, Ethereum is up about 50% this year since January 2020. Ethereum entered the new year, uh, the new century really, at about $130 and is currently trading at about $195. Now the turbulence in the crypto markets and all markets really, reached it as well. Uh, as Ethereum hit a yearly high of $290 in February before plunging to $87 during the panic sell-offs in mid-March. And again, now back up to about $200. So overall, very, very healthy crypto markets, wild volatility, many millionaires made this year, uh, but more lost. Um, but very interesting to see just the institutional demand come in. And that really does go very well with that data coming in from OSL that high net worth purchasing is increasing while we are seeing increased sell flow from debt from uh, from from funds now what's interesting about that is that 99 out of 100 times the idea that the market punishes those who are on the wrong side of the trade too early or that the market punishes those who engage in hurting behavior is correct uh, at significant turning points in the market. However, there are a lot of fundamentals to bake into this. And at the end of the day, this kind of comes down to two major things, right? On one hand, you have the halving. Uh, and on the other hand, you have the market meltdown, right? The idea that the entire market is poised, is getting poised and preparing for another significant sell-off to the downside. The entire market, uh, traditionals, futures, commodities, derivatives, all of that. Uh, and that Bitcoin as a risk on asset will follow along with them, right? So you have to have a very contrary opinion to actually state the safe haven narrative in the face of all that data to say that, well, not only do we have the halving coming up, but we are also betting on the fact that Bitcoin is going to be decoupling. And we can see that large funds seem to be agreeing 
with the market meltdown narrative. Whereas what's very interesting here is that high net worth individuals and institutional investors who are individuals uh, actually are favoring acquiring and accumulating Bitcoin to hold as a safe haven asset. And again, this could be that, remember, 99 out of 100 times, the funds are right. But that one time, they don't get punched in the face because they hedge. But that one time, that one time, and that happens rarely in history, and we have the fundamental events in front of us, they are proven wrong. They are proven wrong, and those individual investors are richly rewarded. So again, we'll see. I think the safest approach for those who are sitting on the sidelines and not actively trading or who are actively trading and looking to acquire position in Bitcoin over the next 30 to 60 days, uh, statistically, accumulation dollar cost averaging for a long-term position intended to be held for at least a year is a good bet, is a good bet. The statistics on your side that if you buy and hold for a year over the next 30 to 60 days with a dollar cost average position, you will be rewarded 365 days from your final purchase. So keep that in mind as we get to the markets, guys. Let me know how you guys are feeling in the chat. Make sure to hit the like button if you guys have not already. With that being said, let's go take a look at what we got today in the markets. Let me also say hello to Ghost7. I see Furry Boff and Alex Jose Canetta, Seifu Mafu, Damian Hughes, Brian B, Laurent Del Bono. We got Saintsy in the house. Good to see you back, my friend. Midwest Attempts and Crypto Jack, as always. Bob the Builder holding it down. Caprica, Mr. Ether, the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only. Boris Bitcoin, good to see you guys. All right, with that being said. Start off on BTC on the daily time frame. Uh, BTC on the daily time frame is currently forming a doji, uh, long to the upside, longer wick to the upside, shorter wick to the downside, meaning that price uh, opened up fairly positively. Uh, it rose with the rest of the market as traditional markets did gap up today. So Bitcoin followed along with that. No gaps in the Bitcoin world because we trade 24 seven. Uh, but we have sold back down. We have sold back down and slightly below slightly below where we actually ended up opening down about negative 0.38 from open right now. Now, looking at our indicators, we are above the baseline. Overall trend directional bias is to the upside, right? The trend is bullish. We're also above the continuation filter in validation on a daily close below 7450. That would flip the trend into neutral daily close below 7240. So let's call it 70. Let's just call it 7250. A daily close below 7250 is going to be putting us into a bearish trend. All right. So, you know, that we've got about a, we've got about a 400 variance here if we are going to go ahead and end the trend bearish. And so, you know, as I always say, a lot of traders are like, Justin, why don't we sell tops? Why don't we sell tops? Because you're almost always wrong. Go grab any reversal indicator and, and actually uh, pretend that you would have sold every single top that it indicated you to sell, right? And you will notice that almost, but most of the time you are absolutely wrong. And that translates into losing money. Do you know what's almost not, uh, do you know what's very rarely wrong? When you have a either a simple moving average strategy or something like the baseline or something that indicates trend directional bias right and when you actually get a trending short signal right when you actually get a trending short signal that is wrong a whole lot less so that is my entire concept when the trend turns bearish short then when the price is bullish view dips as potentials to go long or look to buy momentum longs or breakout longs Eli back. Good to see you over there as well. Nice hash, Logan. All right. So we've got rising volume from Wada Atar explosion still today. Uh, so uh, over the weekend, not a whole lot happened. We did have a nice bullish close on Sunday. Some nice price appreciation pushing us up from the $7,500 price range where we had been trading in and consolidating in with about a $100 range uh, from Saturday and Sunday. So very, very boring days on Saturday and Sunday, as we often see. So very little, uh, in my opinion, inconclusive price data. And what we can actually see is that Sunday, uh, well, today we'll actually confirm it, uh, Sunday we actually got a take profit long signal from Minx, right? And we can see that, right? Minx is very, very close to the overbought territory of 105. Uh, now, the reason why I ignored this was because the signal occurred on a Sunday. So I would like to see the market confirm this over the next few days. And if we look at the CME futures, we can see that we got no such signal. Looking at the CME futures, uh, Minx actually looks quite healthy in the overbought territory, but we still have not gotten that sell to the downside because often when we move into overbought territory, instead, you know, most people think that, oh, we're overbought, we should sell. Often we get, you know, big acceleration to the upside, right? Price can remain overbought for as long as the trend is bullish and price can remain oversold for as long as the trend is bearish. Cornish Trader, good to see you, my friend. 
You go chill back into European friendly times. You know it, buddy. Always here, my friend. Parallax is still bullish, our technical indicator, which is monitoring the divergence between the relative strength index and the commodity channel index. This is still indicating that price is bullish, and this is one of the better indicators, one of our best indicators for actually determining our trend directional bias, right? Now, when that number is positive, when it is above zero, it is likely that price will move to the upside. When that number is negative or below zero, it is likely that price will move to the downside. And as we can see, that number is bullish it is positive listing downwards but the angle does not quite matter it just means that you know we're not getting as much divergence as we have over the past few times and that's what moves that's what moves that indicator to the upside uh so no significant sell signals no significant reversal signals except for the minx take profit long which occurred on spot and not on the futures markets and it occurred on a weekend so for that reason i am going to ignore that signal and just stick to my trending signals right now i still have long exposure open on bitcoin at Ethereum and XRP. We'll be reviewing that at daily close this evening. There was the potential in there for a lower time frame short signal. That trade is already completed. Uh, mostly what I'm focusing on this week is getting our lower time frame bots optimized. These things take a while. There's a lot of markets. They're compiling a lot of data. And my team is working hard on these things. And I'm looking forward to bringing those opportunities to the premium members of the premium trading group. All right, having said that, the daily looks healthy, looking poised for bullish price appreciation. The only things to consider there are the overbought potential there uh, and the take profit long signal from yesterday's uh, yesterday's movement. Looking at Ethereum, we've gotten a little bit more bearish activity coming in from Ethereum, but we were more uh, we were more overextended on Ethereum than Bitcoin, anyways. So unclear whether we can view this as an early warning signal uh, for Bitcoin. However, taking a look here. This is going to be a cross under occurring on a Monday. So this might be deterministic of our uh, of my actual Ethereum position. So we do have Minx crossing to the downside here on a Monday. So we'll see how this daily candle closes. Overall, we haven't closed below the continuation filter. We are still above the baseline, giving us overall bullish trend direction. So overall, my prognosis right now has to be that dips are potentials to go long on on lower time frames and on higher on and on meso time frames. Uh, now. Invalidation for Ethereum will occur uh, if we get a daily close below 187.97. So let's call that 188. If the daily closes below 188, I will exit my Ethereum long and wait for the continuation. Uh, and if we close below 177.60, so let's just call that 177.50, we will actually be in a bearish trend. So we've got some work to do about a $20 pullback that we need to see before we start thinking about taking Ethereum to the downside. Uh, but again, if those things do occur, I would kind of expect the bearish sell-off to be a little bit more pronounced than what we've seen in previous times. Still a bullish parallax over here as well. Still a bullish Wadatar explosion. And again, Minx giving that cross under, as I have said earlier. All right, looking at the, uh, let's get to the two hour time frame right here. This is the Cybot. It is not signaling for any trades right now. Uh, the last few trades that it took were this this long and this long right here. Nothing to do on the two hour time frame. Looking at the four hour time frame, nothing to do either over here. No signals coming in from one of our automated strategies. And looking at the 45 minute time frame, uh, what do we see coming in? There was a 45 minute short signal right here, which would have been a profitable trade. That's the one I talked about earlier. Uh, and overall, nothing coming in today. As we can see, we are trading below today's point of control the volume uh the the area of highest traded volume by price so a lot of activity taking place right here and we can see this if we go down to the lower time frames uh now what we can see is a lot of buying occurring at these levels and as price came up distributed into over and over and over again so after seeing these long wicks to the downside on the lower time frames uh if we go ahead and trade now back above 76.85 and start trading above today's point of control i would view that as an intraday breakout signal and look to take price to the upside alternatively if we end up trading and really closing you know 15 5 you know low low time frame signals down here below 67.50 let's call it 67.50 which really indicates these previous lows, uh, then I would expect price to actually begin moving down. You can see where we've bought back up at yesterday's, at Sunday's point of control, which was distribution right here, distribution right here, and then we broke above. So really all we're doing right now today is we're back testing the level of breakout from Sunday as we got that bullish price appreciation in flowing in uh, towards Sunday evening. And we're looking to back test that and hold that level as support. And the question is, whether or not that is going to happen. Should we actually break below this level and close below 70, uh, let's sorry, excuse me, 76.50 uh, significantly, then I would expect us to move down and let's take a look at where we got. Well, we've really filled all previous points of control. Uh, so 
We've really, we've really filled all previous points of control. And breakout here makes a lot more sense than reaccumulation down here. So unfortunately, I would be of the opinion that if we actually do break below these levels, uh, then we are going to retest this kind of gapped run out here, uh, which makes us have to talk about kind of these more significantly unfilled areas, like 7370. And this level down here around 72.35. So right, so this zone right here, I wouldn't do any limit buying in this zone. Uh, the first area that I would be limit buying would most likely be 71.38. And off of that, I would really only kind of expect a bounce back up to that 72.35 or 73 area, 73.74 at the most. You know, really, in my opinion, uh, a more significant pronounced breakdown here below 76.50 is going to mean a little bit more of a pronounced retracement here intraday, intraday. So going to the daily for a little bit of reference, uh, what would that intraday retracement, what's a good daily downside target for uh, 7450? Yeah, 7450 is where the continuation's at. So 7450 is where the continuation filters at on the daily. And that's about right here. And we can see we've already really accumulated, we've already accumulated that level quite a bit at 74.50. So I think that area is likely counterfeit. I don't really see a return to that level as being necessarily a buying opportunity. Uh, so we'll watch this intraday pretty close. Man, we're getting some pretty aggressive selling right here. We're already below 76.40. We're already below 76.50 right now. Yeah, we've bounced here three times. This actually looks like a pretty negative breakdown, actually. Yeah, I mean, the only kind of bullish case that this would paint would be a sweep down to that 7370 level, which would sweep that previous 7450. But that's not the trade that I like to take. That's not really the sign that I want to see. That's not the bullishness that I want to see. I got to say, as good as the daily looks, the intraday is looking pretty bearish. Yeah. So my first area of interested buying would be if this breaks down, it'd be 7138 to 7235 intraday. Looking for that movement back up to 7371. So having said that, listen, I don't think that shorts here are I won't be shorting here because I'm not going to trade against the dominant trend, but I could see that with invalidation right here because we've already swept this level. So there should be no reason for price to return to this level. And again, if you're going to trade this, not what I'm recommending, not a trade that I'm going to take myself because I don't trade against the daily trend. I'll look for opportunities to go long again, which a movement down to this level right here would fit very nicely with where the daily baseline is and where that entry zone is, where that optimum entry zone is right here. A nice little sweet spot. All right. Having said that, uh, we can also see that the Renko trend is still bullish. Haven't broken the Renko trend to the downside. I expect that we will, though, if we get that selling. But again, we'll watch this pretty closely here over the next couple of hours. All right, looking at the broader market. Looking at the broader market again, the S&P does look pretty good. Uh, overall, markets opened up pretty strong. We can see the futures having a very, very, very nice strong run up. Here's the NQ right here. And of course, here's the Dow, the Russell 1000 having a nice run up as well. Uh, and just starting to get a little pullback. So again, this overall does look to be, this overall here does look to be like a pullback in an overall bullish trend. Uh, now, interestingly here on the one hour, we did get a few minx exit signals. Minx exit signal right here, catching the top pretty well on the hourly. Minx exit signal right here. Do we have one on the Russell? No, not yet on the Russell. Uh, we can see that VIX is actually falling, which which traditionally, uh, so listen, VIX, because this is the SVXY, so the SVXY is the inverse to the VIX. So with VIX actually falling, um, that is typically bullish. That, uh, you know, falling VIX means that traders aren't necessarily panicked and that typically uh, long term trends continue, you know, kind of lazy rising to the upside. Uh, meanwhile, what's interesting here, though, is we can see that gold spot and silver, so very similar to Bitcoin as well, having a bit more of a negative sell off 
uh, as we move forward today as well. So we can see gold slipping ever since market opened. Here's the 26th, then here's the 27th. So slipping basically since market open. This is our USD. This is the CFD for gold and silver here as well, slipping ever since the market opened. So market's open right about, let me find it here, right about here. Uh, and ever since markets open, just big sell to the downside and continuing off, right? So it does look, while it does look like gold and silver here on the hourly, might be actually finding support and just retesting their previous breakout levels. We can see kind of this triple bottom pattern forming on gold. Uh, doesn't really look overall quite bullish. I'm not going to lie. Intraday, looking at the meso time frames and the lower time frames. Does not fill me with confidence. Uh, meanwhile... The actual ETFs are trading up quite well. We can see the SPY opening up and moving strongly to the upside. Again, closing above the continuation filter yesterday, uh, which would, or excuse me, closing above the continuation filter on Friday, uh, which would be validating continuation long trades to the upside. Uh, NQ gapping up, but selling off here. That's fine. So the SPY actually showing the most strength. Dow showing some good strength as well, gapping up and moving up nicely. Uh, and the Dixie actually continues to slip, right? So uh, this would actually, this should be good for Bitcoin, right? As risk, uh, you know, as as in investors move toward more risk on as the Dixie slips, as the as the markets open up. Um, I mean, you know, kind of from a kind of from a normal statistical, what I would expect to see, uh, this would be good for uh, this would be good overall for Bitcoin. And again. Gold looking very much like Ethereum, uh, not very much like Bitcoin. Bitcoin holding up stronger, but gold already pulling back down more closer to the continuation filter here on the daily. Silver as well. Silver not getting sold as hard here on the daily time frame. Oil having another negative day slipping as we move into market open, excuse me, on the CFD here. Still short on USO. Uh, and West Texas oil, the CFD. Not uh, actually the Brent crude index, not actually the Brent crude CFD. Uh, and T-note slipping as well. All right, so we'll see if Brett is right and my Tyson's food short gets invalidated here. Uh, and also, here we go, uh, by popular demand. Uh, here is classical technical analysis looking at BTC. So kind of stepping out of the pathways to profit model. Uh, so I'll just look at some of the most common indicators here and give you guys my opinion on what common indicators are saying. So we have the relative strength. We have the, the usual suspects here. We've got the relative strength index, the MACD. We've got a 10 period exponential moving average and a 20 period simple moving average uh, for moving average crossovers and uh, uh, in trend direction. And down here at the bottom, we've got uh, we've got OBV, uh, which is this is OBV a little smoothed out to give us kind of I had to throw something in there a little 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 sexy. So, you know, this was kind of uh, I got I got hit with. Um, I got hit with, uh, you know, some some requests and uh, and conditions. So I'm work I'm working within the restraints, right? I'm working within the restraints there. Uh, anyways, so uh, Christian Zeladon asks, what do I think about oil prices last week going negative? Question mark. I've got a whole video on that, by the way. Just go check out the Breaking Bitcoin Bits playlist, and I cover the uh, oil prices going negative. I explain why it happens, uh, what is causing it, and what I kind of expect uh, moving forward. Um, overall, uh, the you know oil oil is in a bad spot. I am short on the USO because there is literally no place to put the oil. So either either oil needs to see a spike in demand, which I do not see coming. Or it needs to see um, uh, drills shut down. Drills need to shut down. Or they're, I mean, uh, what they're using right now is like underground, underutilized pipes, and those are quickly filling up. They might, I mean, I don't know. They'll, they'll probably be full within the next week. I'm not an oil expert. Uh, all I do know is that there is physically no place to put the oil, right? There's physically no place to put the oil. And with most economies now confirming that the lockdown is going to continue, at least here in the United States, uh, uh, is going to continue until uh, at least the end of May. Uh, this this does not bode well for transportation, right? So there needs to be a massive increased demand, uh, and with airline companies basically not not operating, I, I don't see where that demand. I don't see where the demand is going to come from. Um, so, um, now with financial intervention, uh, I would actually expect to see not massive dramatic movements in price i think that most likely the 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 legs of the trade are mostly gone but that being said i think there's opportunity there i think that those who are experienced in trading the oil markets know what they're doing i think that those that are relatively new to the oil markets uh should be trading the etf should be trading the etf or 
uh, you know, being educating themselves so that they can trade it in the future, right? Trading it in the future. Now, I think that in the long run, I think that, for example, like the USO ETF is a good price to go long term long on oil. I don't see oil, you know, obviously oil is going to move up in price. Um, so I think it's a good long term investment. Uh, but again, long term investment, right? Trading wise, just trade it on the daily, like everything else, right? And that's gotten us into profitable USO shorts and profitable West Texas oil shorts. Um, anyway, so we've got BTC USD on the daily here. Again, we talked about the doji, uh, not impressive volume. Volume is very low in, uh, uh, on Bitcoin right now, even with this attempted sell-off. Uh, relative strength index sitting above 60. So that is the bullish control zone as known, right? So not necessarily bearish, not in bearish control zone. Needs to cross about the 50 level to be in bearish territory and not overbought, right? So no significant reason to see a pronounced sell-off here. MACD is actually quite positive above the zero line and the uh, and the uh, actual MACD line is above the signal line. No cross under there. Uh, and OBV has been on a nice rise, which means that actual volume uh, relative to the trend has been increasing as price is moving up which is something positive that we want to see and obviously dipping down on today. The OBV 13 EMA is also pretty good. Uh, something that I quite like. Uh, so overall, what I would say is classical TA, uh, classical TA looks actually relatively neutral uh, with, you know, bullish, uh, bullish implied sentiment, right? We were in a bullish trend uh, and nothing dramatic in the form of price depreciation or a significant dip in price. And as we can see, the 10 EMA is above the 20 simple moving average. Uh, and just back testing that simple initiator strategy is actually, by the way, pretty profitable. Uh, and, you know, utilizing price cross closing under the 10 EMA as an exit indicator or using, uh, you know, uh, an exit indicator uh, or uh, momentum oscillator crossover cross under as a as a, as an exit uh, indicator. PTP methodology will help you dial that in. So there you go. You guys get that one for free. Uh, but yeah, you guys can see that uh, 10 EMA crossover occur right on this candle right here. And that would have been a pretty darn good place to buy into BTC. All right, so back to the main charts here. Uh, let's go through and look at, for the benefit of premium members, uh, we'll go and look at open positions currently. Um, looking at the Euro Yen. All right, so this is for the benefit of members of the premium trading group who are following along with our trades. So if you guys are premium members, this will make sense to you because these these are the trades that uh, these are the trades that we're in. If you are not a premium member, these are the trades that are put out uh, via signals via our analysts or by our automated strategies. Uh, so the euro yen, we maintain our short on the euro yen. As you guys know, we've hit our first take profit on the euro yen. Our stop loss is sitting at break even. Uh, looking at the charts, we may be setting on a trailing stop loss if we do end up closing here below 116 on the daily here, but we'll keep an eye on the euro yen and watch. Uh, the euro dollar, uh, let's take a look here. We've actually have had some negative price movement since our re-entry into the euro dollar, uh, but nowhere near our actually kind of wicking up. Actually, I have to check now. Let me pull up my Awanda account over here because that looks like we might have hit our break even stop today. Yeah, the euro dollar is closed out on my Awanda account. So it does seem like the euro dollar trade is closed. We took 50% profit at TP1 on that wick to the downside. Price has moved back and hit our break even stop loss. So uh, the euro dollar is closed. Successful trade, guys. Made some good money on it. Uh, XRP BTC, we do maintain our short on XRP BTC. Uh, it is likely that we'll be putting a trailing stop loss on. We've had some pretty good negative price movement from xrp btc here after entering into our initial short uh so we'll most likely be putting on a trailing stop loss at the end of today's candle uh where are we going to be setting that most likely we're going to be setting that around uh, this says 26.53. I will likely be more aggressive with it and set it most likely or somewhere around 2600 is where we'll likely set that trailing stop. But we'll see. We'll see what the ATR is looking like as we move closer into daily close. Uh, XPD USD. Yes, guys, I maintain the short on this. Strong hands, baby. Held my palladium short open. 
through the weekend and rewarded for doing so. So Palladium moving to the downside. Congratulations to the CFD traders in the Eurozone who are following along with the trades. Uh, West Texas Oil maintained my short on this, even as price walked its way back. Had a couple people message me and say, hey, man, you know, oil is going to pop to the upside. And I said, indicators don't say that. But so uh, holding strong, well below our entry level now on the West Texas Oil short. Uh, looking at USO, held that trade open through the weekend as well and rewarded with a large gap down on the stock and totally worth, honestly, listen, totally worth the uh, totally worth the fee that I have to pay uh, because it's a hard to borrow, uh, hard to borrow ETF. Right. Uh, now, again, potentially uh, I could have got, you know, I, I could have made more profit uh, or I could have gotten a better spread or I'd pay less fees if I were to go register an account with interactive brokers and actually trade the NYMEX futures. But I don't have a lot of experience doing that, right? I don't have a lot of experience doing that. And whenever I enter into a market, I want to be very, very comfortable with my execution. And short selling stocks and ETFs is something that I'm comfortable with doing. I can do it very easily for my broker. I know how to do it like the back of my hand. So I'm willing to pay the extra fee for the convenience and comfort. Uh, can I explain the difference between exponential moving average versus simple moving average? Yeah. So a simple moving average is just um, is just an average, right? So the way that you would get a mathematical average is that let's say we have 10. Let's 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 actually let's figure out what an SMA is. So let's put an SMA on the chart here real quick. Uh, as soon as I figure out how to do that, there we go. So in trading view, we just type in moving average. If I can type. Uh, moving average. And the default is a nine period moving average. So we have uh, a moving average, just an average, it's a mathematical expression, right? So we're averaging, uh, we are averaging uh, numbers. Uh, and in the case of a moving average, we're averaging closing price, right? If you set the moving average to close price, so that's going to be the default. So we're just averaging closing price. So we have a closing price on this day and 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 this day. So we take nine of those in the case of a nine period moving average, right? Nine period moving average. So we add the last nine days. Well, we add current and then the last eight days of closing price up and we divide by nine. And it's that simple. That is going to be the current value of the simple moving average. And then tomorrow we drop off the last one and include the new one and divide by nine. And that's the number that we get. That's how you get a simple moving average. Exponential moving average is a little different because it uses a log function to weight data. So it weights more current data heavier. So it's like a weighting system, right? So uh, it's kind of like the, old, like say we have a nine period exponential moving average where you get maybe one tenth of that data goes actually into the final averaging. And then maybe two tenths of the data goes into the second number and three tenths and four tenths and five tenths and so on. So there is more of the recent price that goes into the lat that goes into the final averaging, right? So that's the kind of nitty gritty of how to do it. Um, there's a lot of information online. Uh, Investopedia is probably a really good resource for, you know, actually getting into the math. And what I like about it is that you can do the math, pull out the calculator and figure it out yourself. Um, but at the end of the day, for a trader, if you want the simple answer, a simple moving average is going to be more smooth uh, and track price um, more constantly. Uh, it's not going to move very erratically, right, uh, relative to erratic price movements, um, which means that when you get signals based off a simple moving average, they're going to be more consistent, but they're going to be slower. You're going to be getting in at worse prices, whereas an exponential moving average moves more dynamically with price, right? So when you get a signal from an exponential moving average, you will get it earlier, i.e. a better price, but at the risk of more false signals. Because again, the exponential moving average is not as smooth as the simple moving average and thus can give false signals more often because it does move so quickly and can move so quickly with price. All right. Uh, great question, man. Thank you so much for that. All right. Where were we here? Thanks, exits. Uh, so uh, still short on USO, rewarded with a large gap to the downside today. Uh, still long on the Australian Kiwi, the Australian to the New Zealand dollar. Still long on the Australian Kiwi, believe. Let me actually pull up my wonder here. Because that looks like a... No, we're not quite to TP1 yet on the Australian Kiwi, but we will hold that open. Uh, now, we are still long on the Netherlands 25 CFD uh, and rewarded again. Price is above our entry now, so price is looking good. Nothing really conclusive here on the NL25. 
Uh, ADA USDT, uh, price has moved nicely to the upside. We don't actually have an exit signal yet, but price is up dramatically uh, since where we entered. Uh, and again, ADA USDT, ADA USDT is going to be following along with BTC USD. And while we expect BTC USD to be strong and continue to the upside, uh, this ADA USDT is, you know, honestly not showing the same strength of a pullback that we would want to see to be overall concerned about the markets. Regardless of Ethereum is selling off a little bit, you know, when I look at Bitcoin, I don't actually see uh, that kind of danger and panic. Uh, and let's see, uh, should I be? Should I be panicked? <laughs> let's check. Make sure I'm not bankrupt yet. <laughs> Uh, you know, what's interesting is actually we're not quite there yet um, on the 45 minute chart. Uh, Minx is actually kind of neutral in saying that we can dip to the downside. Uh, but my 45 minute strategy is actually indicating that there might be a buying opportunity coming up if we do get a little baby leg down, maybe sweep these lows, which would be kind of sentiment trading, uh, kind of sentiment trading, you know, as in, you know, hey, Everybody has bought this dip, and we can see that indicated. Again, if we go down to the five-minute time frame, uh, we can see one, two, three big buys to the downside and three attempted large sell-offs. Uh, and so a sweep of these levels uh, would liquidate anybody that used high leverage. So like a sweep down to maybe 75, 80 uh, would liquidate those positions and price move to the upside. And that would give the nice 45-minute uh, long signal uh, from the ISIS bot right here. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Black Beauty Machine, saying, <laughs> it's my kind of guy, cool and calm. Highly appreciate it, guys. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Philly. Highly appreciate that. Good work on the Pally short. It, you know, it was the system does the work, my brother. Uh, Midwest, I'm no different off stream than on stream. I don't always wear a polo off stream. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see here. Um, where were we? Ah, here we go. ADA USDT on main diversified. So we've already pulled in some really good profits on ADA USDT. Um, now, uh, again, I'm going to have to actually check and pull up my Binance, uh, but I'm only going to do that at daily close uh, to see if my trailing stop loss actually got activated. I believe our trailing stop loss was about at 8%, uh, and that's updated. So did we actually get... 8% to the downside on today's candle. I don't think so. I think our, our position's actually still active and our trailing stop should be like almost right here, if not a little higher, uh, but possible. And if if we, uh, if we our trailing stop loss was activated, I'll know again tonight at daily close. A great trade, great trade. Almost like double digits on that trade for certainly. Uh, now, listen, my long exposure to gold with the IAU uh, is not doing very well. Well, it's only it's, it's a fresh trade. Uh, so no exit signal so far today. Uh, but price did gap down on the IAU ETF as on the GLDM ETF. So again, kind of the only losers that I have in my portfolio right now uh, is going to be uh, the only losers that I have in my portfolio. Well, we'll see. Let's see if we've got we've got more trades to go through. Okay, uh, is uh, IAU and GLDM. But so far, uh, that's the only thing that's doing well. Uh, short on the pound kiwi, as we can see, getting a negative movement from price today after Friday's Doji candle. So this is overall good. We have not hit, uh, haven't hit take profit one yet. So we've got some work to do. This is a fresh trade, of course. Uh, short on the pound Aussie. Now that is we're moving nicely in our favor. Uh, we haven't quite yet hit our first take profit yet, but overall price is looking good. Check the Voss for exits. Uh, now the Voss is starting to curl up on the pound Aussie. So we might be seeing some weak weakness in the Australian dollar moving forward this week. Uh, and of course, my long exposure uh, to gold in the form of the Zhao USD CFD uh, is also not doing so hot today as well. So overall, doing very well in Forex, doing good on the CFD side, not doing so hot on my gold speculation which is okay, which is okay. Uh, and pretty much neutral on EOS, USD, uh, excuse me, long on BTC, EOS, and XRP. Uh, and, you know, mo moderately profitable. Uh, my Tyson short just opened up. We're in a little bit of drawdown on that. And long on the Aussie dollar as well. We are long on the Australian dollar, which... Almost a TP1. Almost a TP1, guys. So overall, portfolio is doing very well today. Uh, overall, doing very good for premium members. Congratulations, guys. The only thing that we're really down on today is gold and kind of flat on crypto with the exception of Cardano. So we will be uh, we will be seeing uh, updates, of course, come out tonight at daily close for the relative markets. And I look forward to seeing you guys there for the close in the trading. All right. Uh, now, I did hear. Let's get back over to this chart right here. 
Now, Zuhair Nakvi, thank you so much for the Aussie $20, my friend. He says, I can't past haste. Either way, the Bitcoin monthly picture. Uh, Heiken Ashi is bearish. There's been a bearish TK cross, a mink short signal, Fisher transform crossing below zero, stochastics down, parallax bearish, uh, but the weekly quite bullish. Is the monthly just not relevant on Bitcoin? You know, here, here's the thing. I, I would argue that the I, I don't trade the monthly chart, and I also don't honestly find myself referencing the monthly chart um, in terms of indicators. Uh, I sometimes will reference the monthly chart in terms of moving averages uh, or Heiken Ashi um, to, you know, kind of broader trend analysis of the monthly. But the reality is that with the vol, I, I think this is just my opinion with the volatility of Bitcoin, the, the monthly, unless you're buying supply and demand. So which by essence is not really an indicator strategy, because when you're buying demand, you're going to be utilizing somewhat of a reversal strategy where you're looking for kind of over sold conditions in conjunction with a level of demand that is historical significance, maybe some volume profile analysis um, and or selling or or selling or shorting supply, uh, which is the same thing. You'd be looking for overbought conditions or uh, in conjunction with a historical significant level of supply of which on the monthly time frame, there's not really a whole lot of those, right? The monthly chart for Bitcoin is not granular um, because it's only been around for a decade. And one would argue that for regular technical analysis, a lot of that data is not really relevant, right? Because price moved on such low volume, uh, excuse me, such low liquidity, right? Exacerbating these dramatic price movements that for our day-to-day -day modern market of high volume, high liquidity, arbitrage, different markets, OTC involvement, uh, you know, derivatives, futures, uh, that we really can't incorporate the data into our backtesting. And I mean, I certainly don't, nor do I advocate incorporating that data, uh, for example, into uh, into my backtest, right? And I know that I, I there are some dissenting opinions on this, right? Um, but I don't think that because I've seen some indicators be promoted as if as they've been back tested on the BLX index for like the last seven years. And I don't really think that means anything, because, as I said, back testing a technical strategy that is based to work off current dynamics of the market off of data that is seven years old, I don't think is relevant. I think we have a different market than we did seven years ago. And I don't think that back testing on the BLX index gives your indicator or strategy any additional credibility. Um, so I would largely agree with you. Now, I don't think that the monthly is not relevant. I just don't think that we can look at the monthly with the same indicators, with the same mindset that we should on the weekly or the daily, because the weekly can give us good signals, really good longer term signals, and the daily can give us really good signals. And remember, you know, on an average daily trade, I mean, we are looking for double digit percentages, right? We're looking between like eight and 15% on a daily time frame trade. And on a weekly trade, we're looking for like 20 to 40%. Uh, return. And that is unheard of in traditional markets. And it's only possible because of the volatility of Bitcoin. So I, I would certainly think that while the monthly is not relevant, I think that looking for the same indicator based data off of the monthly with how wild the price can move is not very productive. I would view the monthly in terms of either candlestick analysis, which is fairly popular, or uh, to analyze levels of supply and demand is what I would utilize the monthly for. Similar to the weekly, I don't actually trade off the weekly. I use the weekly to kind of dial in on supply and demand. And my method of, of determining supply and demand is through the volume profile. So all premium members have seen this in my market analysis that goes out via PDF. Uh, here is the volume profile analysis of mine of, of Bitcoin. So I do utilize this to identify significant levels of supply and demand to help um, to help guide my investment strategies and my longer term ideals and picture of Bitcoin as we progress in price. Uh, good question. Thank you so much, Zuhair. That is a good question. All right. With that being said, let's see what your guys' questions are. And I am going to go ahead and show some love to the DLive nation over there. I see you guys. All, I've got 16 tuning in on DLive today. Now, what's up, guys? Yeah, squeaky tadpole ready to go to the moon over here. As we normally do, let me put some lemons in the basket. Yes, that's a key light. That's a hair light behind me. Don't mind. Don't mind. 
You guys are seeing behind the, the curtain, the Wizard of Oz curtain. Uh, all right, and distribute those rewards. I see you, Valcor, next. All right, any shout-outs over on Twitch? A couple of you guys, 4X Kim, thank you for the follow, my friend, and Sayo... Sayo, Sai, Sai, whoa, yeah, that guy, 1971, thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry, man, uh, thank you for the follow over there on Twitch. Uh, Christian Zeladon. I like how gold is getting more correlation from gold because some mints and middlemen use BTC. I think you mean I like how Bitcoin is getting more correlation with gold because mints and middlemen use BTC. Oh, yeah. Uh, agency says, I didn't know that I used the, uh, the ACD. That's ACDC, babe. Rock and roll. Ain't noise pollution. Or the RSI. Yep. So you missed kind of the explanation for that. Uh, it's been requested. Uh, and I've, I've capitulated, uh, that I do once in a while, just look at traditional kind of classical TA stuff and give my opinion on them. So I did this earlier. For those about to rock, we long Bitcoin. All right. Midwest attempts, the pie guy, Ricky T, Dark Rico and Rhino TD. Locking down the lemons today. Highly appreciate it, guys. Dark Rico, thank you for the two lemons. All right. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about... Uh, tomorrow, I want to talk a little bit about Juggernaut. If you guys haven't heard this, I want to give a shout out to Ansel Linder of Bitcoin and Markets for turning me on to this. Uh, but Juggernaut is a new private encrypted peer-to-peer -peer messaging system built off the lightning network it's absolutely awesome i've looked at it i love it I'm gonna be using it for all of my communications with my asian friends uh anything that's actually not just not just asia because i talk to a lot of people in asia but uh anything that's uh probably not in the united states i'm gonna be gonna be utilizing gonna be utilizing juggernaut so really excited about it uh and when i get some time i'll break into it and kind of break it down for you guys you need you do need to be running a full lightning node not, not hard to do. Johnny, good to see you over there, my friend. All right, let me see what your guys' questions are today, and I'll take what I can. Oh, there it is. All right, Damian Hughes that asked about Cardano. I did go over that. Uh, Maurice Eddy asked about the exponential moving average in the SMA. I went over that. Zuhair Nakfi with his great question. Uh, somebody asked if I could take a look at the hash ribbons indicator on the weekly. You know, I certainly could, but uh, I don't. I don't. Um, I don't have anything uh, terrific to say about it. So there's really not a whole lot of point. I don't have really any particular opinions about it. Uh, I gave my opinions on the hash ribbons indicator earlier uh, and largely just echo echoing what the author of the indicator himself said that, uh, you know, this is the about once a year buy signal from the hash ribbons indicator. However, he did note the caveats that this might be the highest risk because we're pre happening and often before happening, we do see a significant decline in price. Uh, however, uh, that accumulation over the next, he says 30 days, I say 60 days based on my own analysis, uh, but the dollar cost averaging over the next 30 to 60 days for positions that are designed to be held for longer than a year have a very high statistical likelihood of being a profitable investment, right? That's not investment advice, but I will tell you that over the next 30 to 60 days, I will myself be dollar cost averaging more Bitcoin. Of course, I do that every single month, but I am going to be getting a little bit more aggressive this month as I do some rebalancing in my traditional portfolio as well. Um, let's see here. It's 110, guys, so I can only do one chart request. Um, and, you know, all the crypto, all the alt USDT pairs are on the sidelines waiting for Bitcoin right now. So uh, they are all pretty much, for the most part, I've looked at all the altcoin charts. They're all poised bullish. Um, I think that we're going to have some nice appreciation uh, for those that are long, but I don't think we're going to see any altcoins that are not already bullish 
dramatically shift into being bullish. I think that we've got good opportunities for alt to BTC pairs for those who want to stack sats over the next couple of days. Because, you know, here's the thing. If you look at Bitcoin, implied volatility is very, very low, right? So potentially one good strategy is to take some puts out on Bitcoin uh, with IV being so low or to go long on volatility, right? Going long on volatility might actually be, you know, if, if we're being a broad market trader here, one of the best, one of the best plays right now, because because IV is extremely low. Our vol is extremely low as well. Um, so I do want to look at something different. Uh, Boris Bitcoin. I will look at the uh, IJH ETF for you, my friend. So we're going to be looking at mid caps today. And again, you know, and this is what I talked about. It's interesting. It's good to see this movement out of mid caps uh, because... Uh, mid caps and small caps are going to be your higher risk plays, but when you are trading to the upside, they do give larger returns. And I think that overall, mid caps and small caps are more poised to deliver more, um, I don't want to say more consistent, but but larger returns than the large caps uh, or the admiralty portfolios, right? Even though I went long on SGLD, I traded the Admiralty because I like it. It's very consistent. It's very smooth. Uh, but in Wednesdays, last Wednesday, we did the community mentoring session for premium uh, uh, plus professional advanced and elite members. And um, uh, we had talked about the continuations. Oh, this is classical TA. Uh, I want to get to here. I talked about the continuation signal and potential continuation signal looking for price to close above the continuation. Uh, and that's exactly what happened on Friday. It's exactly what happened on Friday. Price above the baseline. We talked about being biased to the upside. So, uh, you know, seeing this nice movement out of the small, out of the mid caps does not surprise me. Uh, this, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. I would... Um, Looking at this chart, I do feel a little aggressive about this one. You know, it looks a little overextended to me, but I do like that close above the continuation filter. Uh, we're pretty far away from the baseline, which does increase our likelihood, um, but uh, we're nowhere near. Hmm. You know, we're nowhere near overbought on the IGH or on traditional markets. And if we're going to get a really nice push here, uh, which it seems the markets are kind of indicating that we are going to get, uh, that's why I remain kind of, that's why I remain bullish on crypto because uh, traditional markets are, are looking good. You know, we're seeing some, we're seeing some contrary signals from like the Voss oscillator, for instance, uh, and Parallax just flipped bullish. And I would say that would be one of the determiners of, um, that would be one of the determining factors of why I feel a little aggressive about this. This does kind of feel like a break and push to the upside. Let's see how IJH closes today. This is not a trade that I myself am likely to take because there are going to be other indexes that are just freshly closing and giving a continuation signal. But let's keep our eye on it. I feel aggressive looking at this chart and looking at the indications. Uh, we do have a continuation. However, if we're not trading against the Voss, which is the most recent idea that I've been playing with, which ha does have a high degree of accuracy, this would be telling us, hey, not your trade right now. So all elements besides the Voss, if we exclude the Voss, I would feel aggressive here. Looking at the Voss is signaling a little caution. But let's see, we've got some, if we end up exiting our uh, risk on gold uh, positions, then we're going to have some rebalancing to do. And potentially small and mid caps might be what we end up uh, speculating on. But I think there's going to be some other opportunities. Let's see what Classical TA has to say. Classical TA is looking good as well. We can see rising volume. OVV is rising. It's bullish. Uh, we've got an ascending MACD. We're about to cross the zero line. RSI is sitting a, at about 60, so about to cross into bullish control zone. Uh, we've had that nice moving average crossover over here, and we're above our, our moving averages. The only thing that's negative is declining volume. 
That's a little bit of volume divergence with price moving to the upside and a level of resistance, but I kind of like that. We double tapped here and now we're moving up on, you know, uh, you know, not there's not a huge volume spike which would indicate a market top. So we're just kind of sliding back into that same level of resistance. This is going to be our third test of resistance and we seem to be blowing past it. Uh, meanwhile, Bitcoin continues to hang out at the lows here. All right. So, okay. So quick summary and wrap up for the day. Uh, if we end up trading after three dips for accumulation, if we end up trading back above 76, let's call it 7680, 7690 today, uh, then I think we're going to push much higher here on Bitcoin. Uh, if we end up closing like the hourly below these levels, I am inclined to think that we sweep down to like the, uh, the 72s. I'm inclined to think that we sweep down uh, because we've already accumulated at this level. There's no reason to return to this level that's not necessarily bullish. Gui, good to see you, man. Hopefully you made money on that, my brother. All right, with that being said, guys, sorry I couldn't get all your questions. I certainly will next time. Please join us tomorrow, and let's head to the scene for an outro. And this, we got to watch, uh, watch the show closely here. Are there audio sync issues? Let me know if there are audio sync issues, because this is always when we get the audio sync issues as we wrap up the show. But assuming that you can hear me and see me quite clearly, thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode of Breaking Bitcoin Market Analysis brought to you by Cracking Cryptocurrency and the Premium Trading Group. Hopefully you guys are safe and healthy today, that you're making wise decisions out there. Of course, if you guys enjoy the content, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. We do highly appreciate that. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. I will try to personally respond to them within the next 24 to 48 hours. And we are always here at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday, to break down the markets and give our opinion on news as it evolves for you. Join us in the Discord for the latest in education and I kind of lost my train of thought there. I had a nice spiel there, but join us in the Discord. That's the best way to stay connected. And if you guys are interested in trading along with us and taking advantages of any of the services that our company offers in the realm of trading, whether that be signals, whether that be premium indicators, whether that be strategy creation or mentoring, make sure to head over to premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com to see how our plan can fit into your trading strategy. Again, my name is Justin for Cracking Cryptocurrency. I will see you guys tomorrow at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Trade safely out there, guys. It's going to be a good day.